You're watching Bill on Bankruptcy. I'm Lee Pacquia. I'm joined now, as always, by Bloomberg News Bankruptcy columnist Bill Rochelle. Be sure to go read his daily bankruptcy column. It's available on BloombergLaw.com, and it's also on the Bloomberg Terminal. Welcome, Bill. Good day. So last week, of course, we talked about how uh, astute investors were making a killing uh, in trading American Airlines stock while it was in bankruptcy. This week, uh, we see the same pattern emerging with another bankrupt company. This time, it's Kodak. Um, the stock has more than doubled in value in the space of just a week. Is it another AMR where investors can make up to 10 times their money? Well, some people have made some good money already. Whether they can keep it is yet to be seen. Here's the story. It's really quite something. On the 12th of March, Kodak stock, of course, is in Chapter 11, was selling for 20 cents each. By the 19th of March, one week later, the stock had more than doubled to 45 cents. Now, here's what's really peculiarly. The stock started its rise on the very same day, or at least the day after, Kodak filed its annual report saying, guess what? Stockholders are not likely to get a red cent through the Chapter 11 case. Huh. Very interesting. Now, meanwhile, Kodak's unsecured bonds, and there are hundreds of millions of them, are selling for about 13 cents on the dollar, which shows you that there is an awful long way to go before solvency and stockholders get anything. Right. Now, Bill, that, that brings up an interesting point. Are we talking about, we're talking about a bankruptcy case here where the equity holders are probably going to be out of the money, yet people are driving the stock up. Is this more about um, the U.S. equity markets in general? I mean, we've been on a bit of a bull run lately. It very could be. Uh, well, it could be. I spoke to several people about this phenomenon with uh, Kodak. And one rather astute investor told me that this is typical behavior for a market top where there's so much frenzy and froth that people look for anything to make a profit, thinking, well, if American Airlines uh, got you 10 times its money, same for other big companies such as Kodak. Now, here's an interesting little tidbit, Lee. Having seen this big stock run up for no reason I could really uh, put my finger on, I ran a story about it. And within the first hour of trading after the story hit the Bloomberg wire, guess what? The Kodak stock was off about 40 Oh, Rochelle, moving markets. Well, we don't get much chance to do that in bankruptcy, but this was one situation. And by the way, there was another company recently in the last week had the same story. This was ATP Oil and Gas. That's right. Its stock ran up from 10 cents to 27 cents for no ascertainable reason. But that stock is already coming back to earth. Mm, really interesting. Uh, we also have a uh, bankruptcy case that was argued this week in front of the United States Supreme Court. Tell us about that one. Very interesting case, uh, especially for lawyers and even for some people who are not. The question is, is an innocent defalcation a sufficient ground to rule that a debt will not be discharged in bankruptcy? Mm. Here's the way it came up. What is a defalcation well, bill? Well, that <laughs> is, that, actually, the Supreme Court justices had to talk about that word and mm. uh, where it came from. I think maybe out of Greek or something like that originally, and they were really not quite sure themselves exactly what the word means, which is what they're going to have to tell us in their opinion. But the case involved a man who was a trustee of a trust. And unbeknownst to him, he invested trust money in a way that was not permitted by the trust. In other words, he didn't know that he'd done anything wrong, but he was saddled with a $285,000 judgment, which the bankruptcy court held was not discharged in his bankruptcy because it was a defalcation while acting in a fiduciary capacity. The question the Supreme Court is going to answer is, do you have to at least know that what you're doing is wrong before a debt will be declared not discharged? Justice Scalia was his usual acerbic self. I kind of hope he writes an opinion either the majority or the dissent, because it will be very interesting. And by the way, the name of this case is called Bullock versus Bank Champlain, or Champagne, that is. I have a feeling we'll have a decision in about six weeks. And of course, uh, we have some new filings. Bill, no matter how slow things are going in the bankruptcy courts, you can always count on a Yellow Pages publisher to end up in Chapter 11. We have two ones now, Dex and Supermedia. They both filed Chapter 11, and they're planning to merge through uh, companion reorganization plans. Uh, both of them were in bankruptcy before. Are they going to fix their businesses this time around? They're a good question. You know, some businesses cannot even operate profitably with no debt. I, mean, I always remember... Uh, 
Grand Union supermarkets. It was in bankruptcy several times. The right, next they were at Chapter 44, I believe. Oh, they right? were, yes. <laughs> at the end of the, the day. The third time they came out with no debt at all, but they still failed a few years later. The problem with the Yellow Page business is uh, really evident by what these companies said in their first day filings in bankruptcy court, and that is uh, they used to just publish, uh, you, you know, paper Yellow Pages, and now they're trying to save themselves by expanding into the Internet. Problem is, they don't have the programming muscle or the know-how of big companies like Google, for instance. And so one has to wonder, if you're now in a technology business, but you don't have the technology know-how and power, can you survive on the long run? I'm sure this puppy is going to come out of Chapter 11. These two companies are going to merge through bankruptcy. Whether they survive is yet to be seen. Right, and of course, if the name Supermedia doesn't ring a bell, uh, you might recognize it by its previous name, IdeaArc. Um, that's what it was called during the first bankruptcy, where the plan created a trust to bring a lawsuit on behalf of creditors. And of course, uh, Verizon was the target of uh, one seeking almost $10 billion, 9.8 to be uh, precise. So far, Verizon has been beating the pants off the creditors of idea arc, but I gather they haven't quite given up yet. Where is this whole suit going to end up? It's an enormous sum of money. This is a case about a huge, albeit minor, technical flaw. <laughs> idea arc was a subsidiary of Verizon. It was spun off in 2006. The creditors unsuccessfully argued that it was insolvent from the moment of the spinoff. A federal district judge in Dallas disagreed, said no, the company is worth $12 billion and was not insolvent when it was formed. The creditors discovered a little problem. The Articles of Incorporation called for IDARC to have two directors. Instead, they only ever appointed one. Theoretically, all of the corporate actions that took place later with one director were not sufficient. This is a wonderful question about what is the consequence of a minor, albeit let's call it major, technical flaw in the formation of a corporation. This, by the way, is one of those situations you say, oh my God, there but for the sake of God go I. This was probably a mistake made by a first or second year associate who simply pulled out the wrong form in forming uh, ID art. But the question is, what are the consequences? If you have this major yet minor technical flaw, should it mean billions of dollars of losses or is the uh, district judge going to let them out on some lesser basis or perhaps let them out altogether? And finally, we have a really, really interesting item on the advance sheets. Bill, a bankruptcy judge in California handed down a downright scary decision in the bankruptcy of law firm Heller Ehrman. Um, why, in your opinion, should lawyers just be scared of this one? Well, law needs to be fixed here. That's my own personal view about it. You mean law of the business or you mean actual written law? Well, this is a decisional law. First came from an intermediate appellate court in California in a case called Jewell versus Boxer. This case said that when a uh, law firm goes bust and a lawyer from that firm takes business with him or her to a new firm, that lawyer has to give the old firm the profit on the business that was taken to the new firm. The uh, bankruptcy judge, a very fine judge by the name of Dennis Mentale in San Francisco, wrote a decision this month in which he hung four big law firms out to dry for having taken business over and partners over from the defunct Heller Ehrman firm. Now, I guarantee you this case is going to be appealed, and if I had to venture a guess, probably will be reversed on one of several grounds. Also, by the way, the very same issue is hotly in litigation on appeal right now in New York. There is a case in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit involving the defunct law firm Kudair Brothers, where there are district judges in New York who rule the opposite way on the same question. Mm. One said, yes, you're liable. The other said, no, you're not liable for paying over the profits on work that you took with you. Uh, this is an important issue because if at the end of the day, a lawyer takes business with him or her and has to cough up the profits, that means that a lawyer at a failing firm ain't very marketable. All right, Bill, thanks for that. That's Bloomberg News Bankruptcy Council, Bill Rochelle. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just ran through, be sure to go read Bill's column. It's available on BloombergLaw.com, and it's also on the Bloomberg Terminal.
I'm Luke Pacquiao. Thanks for watching and see you next week.